If you look at the two of us standing here together, you might speculate, what do they have in common? There are some outward similarities. We're both of European descent. We both were born into privilege, giving us access to opportunities and resources. And we both seem like approachable, pleasant people, maybe a little nervous. But what you can't see is that Catherine and I share a lived experience that connects us deeply and motivates the work that we do together and individually. We have both recovered from an eating disorder. And while every eating disorder experience is different, like over 30 million Americans, Catherine and I used maladaptive coping strategies like disordered eating or disordered movement patterns to cope with difficult feelings and thoughts and life experiences. And those behaviors could have been deadly. Every 52 minutes, someone dies from an eating disorder. Though our behaviors were unsustainable, they were effective coping mechanisms, at least in the short term. They provided a sense of control. They provided a reprieve from feelings of insecurity and self-doubt. They even garnered praise. Eating disorders aren't really about food. They aren't problems that can be fixed by just eating less or eating more. They're complex mental illnesses that are often coexisting alongside issues like anxiety, depression, and OCD. They, are, they also are a natural response to a message that we receive almost every single day. That message is this. If we manipulate what we eat and how we move, we can manipulate our bodies to fit an ideal. And if we can fit that ideal, we'll be happier, more successful, more worthy of love. And people who fall prey to that diet culture message aren't weak or gullible or vain, quite the opposite actually. Everyone Catherine and I have interacted with on our podcast or in our work individually have been some of the most incredible, passionate, intelligent, wonderful people we've ever met, all from different backgrounds, life experiences, and identities. And to better demonstrate the impacts diet culture and disordered eating can have on people from different backgrounds and identities, Catherine and I would like to share our stories with you today. So I have a very vivid memory. I was in middle school. I was at church on a Sunday morning with my family, and I saw an older neighbor. neighbor. She was a high school girl who was beautiful, bubbly, popular, the kind of person that I wished I could be like. I hadn't seen her for a while. I knew that she had developed anorexia, but at that point I didn't really know exactly what that meant. And when I saw her, I was shocked. She looked like a ghost. And at that moment, I remember thinking, I would never do that to myself. It wasn't a thought that came from a place of judgment. I think there was probably some fear involved, but also just that lack of understanding. My 13-year-old self couldn't understand how someone would just not eat. Well, fast forward about seven years. I'm in college, and I'm at a competitive school where every student was top 10% of their class and a student leader did all the great things. I started to feel like I didn't belong, like I wasn't good enough to be surrounded by so many successful, well-rounded students. My insecurities deepened into self-hatred. My social anxiety ramped up and made it really difficult for me to connect with other people. I was spiraling into a depression so full of negative emotion, I knew that I needed a way to feel better. All of the diet messaging that I had internalized over the years gave me a viable option. I could try to lose weight, become more fit. And if everything that I had read over the years was right, that would make me more confident. That would make me happier. That would make people like me more. So I eliminated foods that I thought were unhealthy. I increased my exercise every day. And in the short term, it worked. I lost a few pounds, and I did start to feel better about myself. I didn't think quite so much about the things that weren't perfect about me, because I was thinking so much about what I was going to eat or how I was going to exercise. It gave me a sense of control over a life that felt out of control, and it helped me feel virtuous like I was doing something really amazing, that I had willpower that other people didn't have to achieve a goal that other people couldn't achieve. But over time, in order to feel those good feelings, I had to increase the intensity of my behavior. 
it got to a point where I was eating so little and I just kept cutting things out of my diet that I, I didn't have much to eat at all during a day. And I was exercising as much as my body would allow. It was as if I had downloaded a harmful computer virus that threatened to completely wipe away my personality and destroy me. I no longer was able to go to social events or even interact with the people in the house that I lived in. I became increasingly withdrawn. And all I could really think about was what I was or wasn't going to eat and how I was going to move. I had become a shadow of myself. I had become like a ghost. One day, I was on the phone with my mom before class, just a quick check-in call. And this is another vivid memory. I was looking in the mirror, and it was like for the first time in months, I could see myself clearly. And in that moment of lucidity, I told her that I was worried. I was worried that if I kept doing what I was doing, I would end up in the hospital, or worse. Externalizing that thought was a huge turning point for me. I shed light on darkness, and that enabled me to start on a path to recovery. And fortunately, I was able to mitigate those severe behaviors relatively quickly. I honestly don't even know how. That whole period of life was a blur. But I was able to get to a point where I could enjoy classes again. I could feel some relief from that pressure to be perfect. And I could connect with people around me again. And it got to a point where I was able to get married. I was able to have three beautiful children and live a life in pretty solid recovery. But even for those 20-some years, I still held on a little bit to the disordered ways of thinking. And if I felt a lot of stress or if I was feeling low confidence, I would listen to that eating disorder voice. But a year ago, Francis and I started our podcast and we regularly have conversations with really amazing people about all of these issues. And that has brought so much healing. Talking about eating disorders and disordered eating and feelings of insecurity and shame and all of that has brought me to a more profound and deeper recovery than I ever thought was possible. And Catherine's not alone in her story. The high levels of anxiety, the need to be and drive to be perfect, and the need to control an aspect of life that feels out of control all play a significant role for many in the development of an eating disorder. And diet culture knows this and uses it in part to fuel a billions and billions of dollars industry focused on exploiting those high levels of anxiety, that drive to be perfect, and the need for control, the feelings of shame. And its impacts are overt. In a large study of teen girls, dieting was the most important predictor in e developing an eating disorder. Even moderate dieting, teens were still five times more likely to develop an eating disorder. I bought into the thin ideal, and that at least in part contributed to my own eating disorder. But there's a corollary to that that's equally damaging and insidious. It's the idea that larger bodies are not healthy, that they're inferior to smaller bodies. It's this idea that people in larger bodies are somehow flawed, that they're not moving and eating in the right ways. That explicit weight stigma and fat phobia crosses all levels of society, and it impacts everyone. It leads to disordered behaviors like restricting, compulsive exercising, binging, and purging. And some people are told when they're very young that their bodies are wrong, that their bodies need to be fixed. And that is sad and devastating. I was eight years old when I went on my first diet, but let's rewind slightly. Summer 1993, I'm a typically happy and healthy seven-year-old, and my parents, at the advice of our pediatrician, took me to see a registered dietitian as my weight for a number of years had been above the curve, the body mass index curve. And so we saw the dietitian, and what they indicated was that weight loss wasn't needed quite yet, but that weight maintenance was, whatever that meant. I was seven years old, I had no idea. But we left, everyone seemed hunky-dory. And about a year passes, fast forward, I am in third grade, I'm playing on the playground, I loved pizza day, 
I had my first little crush on a classmate, and my weight had not maintained. I was still above the curve. So we went back to see the dietitian, and they had indicated that maintenance did not work and that I needed to lose weight. And there it was, the message that stuck with me for nearly two decades, that despite all the evidence suggesting and all the vital signs suggesting that I was a typically healthy person and kid, because my weight was above the curve, my health was determined to be poor and the outcomes poor. I was eight years old and no other variables were really discussed about how a fat or big body can develop. My parents' or grandparents' bodies weren't discussed. The fact that we came from a privileged household and had access to a lot of food and any food we really wanted. The fact that my family loved food, we celebrated with food, we mourned with food, we grieved with food. Weight and body mass index were the only metrics used to tell me and my parents that there was a problem, that my body was a problem, and that I was a problem. And that meeting with the, ther or the dietitian was the first time I consciously recall feeling shame. I felt like I'd let my parents down. I felt like I'd let my friends down. I felt like all the problems an eight-year-old typically have now were all onto my body, manifested onto my body because it was wrong. I was eight years old and my love for the playground dwindled slightly. My love for pizza day dwindled a lot. And it was the first time I thought to myself, who could ever have a crush on a body like this? And those messages stuck with me for nearly two decades. In books, TVs, magazines, friends I had, family I had, conversations, there was this pervasive and obsessive message, it seemed, about body image and having the ideal body and what we should be eating and what we should be, uh, um, how we should be moving. We were all obsessed with how we looked. It took away from the more salient parts of my, our lives and my life. And people I didn't even know would have conversations with me about my body as if it was okay. And I accepted this as normal because I thought I was the problem. And I was determined to fix the problem. And through fixing it and hating my body, I developed an eating disorder. I restricted, I binged, I purged, I over-exercised, all in the effort to look a certain way and to fit a certain ideal, and really in an effort to gain some sort of feeling, and then eventually no feelings at all and numb it all out. And I eventually hit my lowest of my lows, but not before being praised for my efforts. At some point, my weight did significantly decrease, and everyone around me said, wow, this you look amazing. How'd you do it? This is wonderful. And they even said, you look so healthy. And the truth is, I was, at, I was the least healthy I'd ever been really in my entire life. I was in my mid-20s, chronically sick with an eating disorder, severely depressed, binging, purging, using all the behaviors, compulsively lying, compulsively exercising, compulsively spending money. And even at that low point with all of that happening, do you know what I said to myself? I said, well, at least I don't have a bad body anymore. And that is the power and pervasiveness of diet culture. Eventually, I sought help. I saw a licensed therapist and a registered dietitian who specialized in eating disorders, and I slowly began to heal. And I learned a lot through this process and this experience. I learned that as a male, I'm not immune to this disease. I learned that no identity is immune to this disease. I learned that an eating disorder is a disease and not about willpower. I learned that people who diet will gain the weight back and more 95 to 99% of the time, meaning diets do not work, meaning diet culture is a lie. I learned that body image dissatisfaction or hatred is the leading contributing factor to developing an eating disorder. And that, in a word, is really scary because we all live in a society that constantly is telling us to look a certain way, move a certain way, eat a certain way. It takes away from the other salient parts of our life. And that's where my story shifts slightly, at the realization that my body is actually the least interesting thing about me. And I have so much love, intelligence, strength in other areas to give to this world, and recovery was so worth it. As our stories demonstrate, diet culture is pervasive. It impacts every single person. But it is possible to find recovery. It's possible to find freedom from that. If you are dealing with disordered ways of thinking about food and your body and movement, reach out to a professional. 
There are licensed counselors and registered dietitians that operate from a health at every size and anti-diet lens who can help you take that first step to recovery. You can also educate yourself. There are three important books to start with. Health at Every Size by Lindo Bacon, Intuitive Eating by Evelyn Trivillet, and Anti-Diet by Christy Harrison. They will change the way that you think about food in your body. And if you're looking to minimize disordered ways of dealing with food in your body and movement, consider getting rid of all the numeric data surrounding those things. Mash your scale. Stop reading nutrition labels. Turn off your fitness tracker. Instead, learn to listen to your body. Your body will tell you what it wants to eat and when, and how it wants to move. And if you're tempted to watch those What I Eat in a Day videos that show up on your feed, just don't do it. They're toxic and harmful. They foster food obsession and comparison, both of which an eating disorder thrives on. They also ignore a basic fact. Two people could eat and move in exactly the same ways and still have very different bodies. We all have unique bodies. We all have unique nutritional needs. And if you feel bad when you scroll through social media, evaluate your feed. Maybe there are accounts that you're better off not following. You can also add accounts that showcase the beauty of every single body. You are the expert on yourself, and you can fight back against diet culture by getting to know yourself a little bit better. Ask yourself what you value. Ask yourself what you need in certain situations. Ask yourself what, what's joyful to you and strive for it. Strive for what you want, even if you feel like you might fail. And finally, and most importantly, remember this. Your body is not a problem. You are not a problem. You, with whatever body you have, make this world shine. Thank you so much.